hello guys hello everyone hello 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 how are you all doing how is everyone doing welcome to another sunday welcome to another sunday hope everyone's been keeping well hope everyone's been keeping uh safe during this i don't know whether to call it still lockdown period but we're here, whatever they decide to do, we're, we're still alive and we're still kicking, so it's amazing to be with you all, but let me all know how you're doing in the comment section, let's get active, let's get active, let me know you're here, and then we can get going, how's everyone doing, how's everyone doing, okay, Need to speak a bit louder. That's cool. I'll start off with myself. My week's been all right. A bit busy, but I don't know how to. I don't know. There's just been a bit of a bit of things I've or a few things I have to tie up or I've had to tie up recently. So I think it's been an interesting week for myself, but pretty productive. But um, let me know about yourself. How is everything going for you guys? We can get going. With regards to that. I'm trying to find the comments actually. It's not allowing me to view them on my phone. But we're just going to give it another minute or two and then we're going to start with a time of prayer. Okay, amazing. Now I can see you guys. Hello. Olamide, Nikki, Muller Max, PT, Jasmine, Shia, Carissa. How are you all doing? Let's light up the comment section, guys. Good to see you all. Well, I can't see you, but good to feel your presence. We're just thanking God for another Sunday. Hello, Benny. Productive week. That's good to hear. That's good to hear. Week's been productive. On a scale of one to 10, how would everyone rate their week? Samuel, hello, how are you doing? On a scale of one to 10, there's a special prize for the person that comments fifth. On a scale of 1 to 10, it's been a good week. All right, cool. That's good. That's good. That's good. That's good. It's actually crazy. I haven't seen some of you guys literally nearly for about eight months plus. Some of you maybe even a year now. Literally coming up until the, the time where lockdown actually started. But hopefully we should be able to see you soon. About an eight. Okay. Eight is good, to be honest. Eight is very good. D sneaker corner, very chilled. It's been a solid six, seven, ten, seven. Mm, I'll give it a seven. Productive week, eight. Mm, about a six. Okay. These are good numbers. These are good numbers, to be honest. You guys don't really need much cheering up for me, then. Exactly, a whole eight months. But don't worry, soon come. We're gonna fly the church out to Miami and have a <laughs> have a service on the beach. <laughs> ah, we'll evangelize to people in Miami and Florida and catch a tan as well. But cool, we're gonna get into a time of prayer now. Um, and the scripture I want to read for this is Psalm 100. It says, "Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness." Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. So in that line, I want us just to just begin to bless the name of the Lord. I want us to begin to praise him and exalt him. Um, this week, for many of you, has been a fantastic week, but it seems of it, productive week. Um, so I just want us in that vein to begin to bless God. Thank him for allowing you to continue or uh, enabling you to do what you've been able to do this week. Um, for those of you, who, there may have been setbacks. That's fine. 
there's still a reason to bless the Lord. Um, the fact that he's seen you through that, the fact that you're able to learn specific lessons from that is a cause to bless his name. So Father, we just bless you and we give you praise. Father, we exalt you. We thank you because this is a day that you have made. Your word says we should shout for joy to all the earth and worship you with gladness. Come before your presence with joyful singing and we know that you are God. You are. It is you who made us and not we ourselves. Father, nothing that we've done is by our own merit. Nothing we've done or we can do is by our own um, ability or strength Lord and even that which we have been able to do by our own strength we know that you have empowered us to be able to do um, that which we've been able to complete so father we thank you father we thank you for even that which you started your word says that which you start you're able to complete so father we bless you for completing and perfecting everything that you've started within our lives father we thank you for your grace your word says that your grace is sufficient for us and your strength is made perfect in our weaknesses Father, thank you for being made perfect. Thank you for strengthening us in the midst of our turmoil, in the midst of our weaknesses, in the midst of our shortfalling. Just begin to bless the Lord for his strength be made perfect in your weakness. Um, sometimes we look down on ourselves. Sometimes we're, 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 we, we soul can we get down about, you know what, I'm not able to do this. I'm not able to do that. This isn't going well. That isn't going well. But the Lord says that he makes his strength perfect in our weaknesses. So I want us to begin to bless him for making himself perfect. Thank you for the lessons you've been able to teach me. Lord, I've made countless mistakes this, this week, but thank you, Lord, for your hand. Your word in Psalms 23 says, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Your rod that's able to that's able to rebuke me and your staff that's able to guide me. Father, I thank you, Lord, at the, the, the times where I've stepped out of line and you've been able to say, you know what, Israel, um, this is this is how you can improve. This is what you can do better. Father, we thank you because your word says that you, he who the Lord loves, he also chastises. Father, we know that this walk is not a bed of roses until we thank you for your voice that still um, speaks correction to us when we need it. Father, we're thanking you, oh God, for your provision. We thank you because because we are the sheep of your pasture. We thank you because you are the one that provides. You are the one who supplies all our, all our needs according to your riches and glory. Father, we thank you because we never lack. We thank you, Lord, because we haven't lacked, um, whether it's materially or whether it's spiritually, whether it's emotionally, we thank you for supplying, oh God. Your word says you even give your beloved sound sleep. Father, in this time of turmoil, Lord, there's so many people that can't even sleep. There's so many people that can't even think straight, but we thank you for sound mind. Lord, we thank you because you are one that gives us rest. Lord, not only rest in our finances, but rest in our soul, rest in our spirit, Lord. So many people are anxious, but your word says, be anxious for nothing. But by prayer and petition, we should make our requests known unto you. And the peace of God that transcends all human understanding will guard our hearts. So Father, we thank you for filling our hearts with peace. We thank you for filling our hearts with joy. Father, we bless your name and we exalt you. We give you praise in Jesus' name. The next what prayer we're going to pray um, is one of my favorite. Um, is from my one of my favorite passages of scripture, as some of you would know, and that's in Ephesians 1:18. I feel like we can't pray this prayer enough. And that scripture says, "I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, in order that you may know the hope to which He has called you, the riches of His glorious inheritance in His holy people." And I want us to just pray today that the Lord would open our eyes to see. He would open our eyes to see and open our ears to hear. But Lord, let's let's pray towards specifically our eyesight, because wherever wherever the, the, the scripture says where there is a lack of vision the people cast restraint. We don't want to be a people of restraint just because we cannot see. Um, and Father, we're just asking right now that you would flood our eyes with your light, with your illumination, Lord, with your revelation, Lord, so that we would be able to see as you see, Lord. We would be able to distinguish the right from wrong. We would be able to discern through vision, through sight, oh God, that which you have prepared for us today. And Father, we just cleanse our eyes by your precious blood. Just begin to speak the blood of Jesus or begin to plead the blood of Jesus. Begin to release it over your eyes. Father, we release your precious blood over our eyes, oh God. Cleanse our eyes from things that we've seen um, presently. Cleanse them from things we've seen in times past and cleanse them from the things that we even predict about our futures, oh God. Father, some of us, or, or there's many things that I may have watched, oh God, that have may, um, been unpleasing to you or, 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 or distorted or 
or tainted um, the, 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 the content of my heart or the posture of my heart. And Father, I'm asking, oh God, that you cleanse my eyes by your precious blood. Cleanse my heart, Lord. Cleanse me from the things that I have seen that have been deposited within my soul that have affected my view of you. Your word says, casting down every imagination or vain imaginations that exalt themselves above you. So Father, the things that I've seen that have caused me to perceive you differently, that have caused me to see you, uh, me differently as a result, Father, I'm asking that you restore my eyesight, you restore my vision. Father, fill us with the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you, that our hearts be enlightened, our eyes be enlightened in the name of Jesus. Father, we're asking, let the spirit of revelation, let the spirit of wisdom even dwell amongst us as we even partake from your, from, from your presence today in the name of Jesus. Help us to engage in Jesus' name. The next prayer I want us to pray is from Isaiah 29 verse 13. And that scripture says, the Lord says, these people come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is based on merely human rules that they have been taught. I'll read that again. These people come near me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship is based on merely human rules that they have been taught. Two things about this scripture that I'm even seeing now as I'm reading it is that to come close to the Lord or to draw close to the Lord, there's two key things that are important. It says, these people come near me with their mouth. So there's something about the declaration. There's something about how we speak of God that pulls us closer to him. But it's not enough to just speak well of God. It's not enough to just speak um, or minister to the Lord through the things that you say. It says that they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. So what the Lord is saying is that it's not just by your words. It's just not by, your, by, by the words you utter, but it's about the posture of your heart also. I don't just want your words, but I need the heart behind the words. And so today we're going to pray that Lord, sanctify and purify my heart. And I'm going to tie this in with the next scripture in Psalms 19 verse 14. It says, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable. So we're just going to pray right now that, Lord, we wouldn't be a people that seek you with our lips or draw near to you with our lips. But we'd be a people that seek after you with our hearts. And it even reminds me of the scripture in Psalms where David prayed, as, or he even mentioned, as the deer panted for the water brook, brook, so my soul longeth after you. Father, we're praying right now that we will draw close to you with our hearts. Father, we release everything right now on our hearts, Lord, within our minds, Lord, that restricts us from drawing closer to you, be it things we may have done, be it things we may be going through. And Father, we just release those things right, right now onto you. And we ask that the words of our mouth and the meditation of our hearts will be acceptable. Can you see right there, even in that scripture, it talks about the words of your, your mouth, but the meditation of your heart. And we see those two things coming together in agreement. Father, we're praying right now that the confession, the profession of our mouth, Lord, would match the posture of our hearts. Father, no longer would we be people that only seek after you with what we have to say, that only seek after you when we have things to demand of you. But we'd be people, Lord, that seek you, that yearn for you, Lord, with everything that is within us. So Father, cleanse our hearts. Cleanse our hearts. We're just going to pray for forgiveness right now. Forgiveness of any way we have fallen short, of any way we may have wronged God, wronged the people around us. We want to pray that the Lord would forgive us. Father, we're asking for your forgiveness. We're asking for your forgiveness. Father, your word says, if we confess our sins, you are just and able to forgive us. And Father, we know that we have so many flaws, we have so many weaknesses. So many things we do are not even unknowing, Lord. We do so many things that are bad or that are against your pleasing, Lord, knowing, Lord, knowingly. And Father, I ask, oh God, that you would forgive me. I'm asking, Lord, that you would forgive your children of all the ways that we may have wronged you, that would cause you to not hear us, that would cause you to be um, displeased with us, Lord. 
Father, our desire is to please you. Our desire is to please you. And Father, we ask, O oh God, by the precious blood of Jesus, cleanse our hearts, cleanse our lips, cleanse our eyes, cleanse our ears, cleanse every part of our being, O oh God. For the areas we've disobeyed you, Father, we ask for grace to be able to obey you and to repent, to turn from our wicked ways in the name of Jesus. And Father, I just want to pray right now that even as we go into a time of worship, Lord, that you would even um, be pleased with the offering that we have to bring. Help us to minister unto you. Help us to cast our burdens, our, our cares to the side so we can fix our gaze on you. Um, in Jesus' name I pray. So I believe now we're going to go into a time of worship. Um, I really want you to center your focus in on Holy Spirit. Um, and allow him to, to draw you closer to himself, allow him to quicken you as you go into this time of worship.
for making a way thank you Lord Jesus the word says that you cause you make a way in the wilderness and you cause rivers to spring forth in the desert so father we thank you because you are a way maker we bless you and we give you praise we honor you in Jesus name we worship amen 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 that's just a glimpse or that's just a short um, bit of what we can do worship never stops your worship to god should never cease um and make it uh, a point of call 
that we should all um, spend more time in extended worship. YouTube won't give us the time to do that. But in your own time, you can go back and finish ministering to the Lord um, as, as, as you do so. Um, so right now we're going to go into a time of giving, which is also out part of our ministry to the Lord. Um, we want to give to him within our finances, the different ways to give to the Lord um, through your resources, through your time, through your, um, your skills, through your intellectual property, um, through your devotion, through sacrifice. Right now, um, we make it a habit to sacrifice part of our finances to the Lord. And so we want to go into a time of giving. Um, for those of you that have your tithe or your offering, um, we're just going to put the details up on the screen for you to be able to give. Um, and we're just going to use that to wrap up our time of worship and we're going to move into the word. So give happily, give cheerfully. The Lord loves a cheerful giver. Thank you for the opportunity to give, Lord. Father, we're just praying right now. Um, every person that has given, every person that has sown, especially those who have sown out of a place of um, scarcity or lack, Father, we're thanking you for breakthrough. We're thanking you um, for your favor and your blessing to rest upon them. Um, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So, guys, um, I just realized that I didn't really introduce myself um obviously speaking to the cw fam you'll know who i am but i'm just remembering there's some of you that are not quite quite acquainted with us or don't commonly join us um so my name is israel um israel Kenfenwa, um brother of app um apostle iman um i'm one third of the senior leadership at cw aka the dream team aka the avengers um aka light nation um it's amazing um, we're literally family, um, family by blood, family by by bond, um, and you guys are all family as well. And it's amazing to be a part of you. Um, it's amazing to be here with you. Um, I think the last time you guys probably saw me was at the crossover service, um, but yeah, I think it's just because of distance, time travel, all that type of stuff. Um, but you should be seeing me more frequently as things begin to ease. Um, so yeah, it's amazing to be with you guys. Um, Apostle is actually with um another fellowship or another um church um so he's asked me to take today um and so yeah i'm with you you guys are you guys are stuck with me um which is a good thing um so yes what we're gonna do is we're gonna get into the word today so thank you to um apostle to uh, for the opportunity to share with you guys um i know last week was a very sobering word um ironic sobering it was valentine's day You're expecting something that would ginger you a bit but uh, really and truly that word was needed um love or lust um and i think that really um gave us a heart check or time to reflect on our hearts and so um moving on from that 
Um, this is sort of a completely different theme, um, but one that I feel like is very pertinent to this time. Um, so I feel like, um, as you would know, at City Worship, one of our key focuses is on light. Um, light in general, light as in um, being children of light, um, as God being the light or Jesus being the ultimate light. Um, and how we are light bearers, how we are light carriers. Um, and one of the main emphasis we try to focus on is how we can be light to the people and the environment around us. Um, one of our foundational scriptures for this is found in Isaiah 60. And I'll briefly just read um, from verse one to three. It says, Arise, shine, for your light has come and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. For behold, darkness covers the earth and thick darkness over the peoples. But the Lord will rise upon you and his glory will appear over you. Nations will come to your light and the kings to the brightness of your dawn. And so for me, this, the emphasis this year more than ever is our mandate to be torchbearers um, and how to harness the torches or the light we've been given. Um, and one of the key ways or the key outlets by which we do this is actually through evangelism. Um, and that's one of the key um commissions we were given by Jesus Christ himself telling us to preach and to teach the gospel to make disciples of nations um, and so we can see that when it comes to this topic or this concept um, it's, it's usually misunderstood so for an example people feel uh, there's there's notions as if like evangelism is only for people who are evangelists or what is an evangelist um, what is that grace or what is the difference between evangelism and the evangelist? Is it only for one set of people? Is it for all of us? ETC. Um, what is another one that we that we have? Uh, maybe that it can only be carried out through a specific context or through a specific means in a specific environment. Um, these are some of the misconceptions people have. You also see that it's also avoided, um, especially because people don't know how to go about it or make it relatable to their walks or lives. So we see that um, evangelism is usually misconstrued, is literally put on a back burner because people are like, as soon as you say evangelism, they're like street corner or high street, someone holding a Bible, someone holding a leaflet, chasing you down. Even me as a Christian, I can't lie. There's times where those people, I see them or I've seen them before um, and I'll cross the road just so they don't chase me with the leaflets. Um, I've repented of my sins and I know God has forgiven me in Jesus' name. Um, but you get the point. Like, wait, there, there, there's such a, a old-fashioned or outdated perception of what it is. And I'm not knocking or bashing um, that context or that expression of evangelism, but that is not the only one. Um, and I think because people have only seen it one way, they don't know how to apply it or see where they fit in in the grand scheme of things. Um, and I feel like it's something that the Holy Spirit has been challenging me to step up in, uh, me, myself. So it's like, as God was sharing this with me this week, it was a thing where he was taking me and guiding me through this as well, um, because it's an area that he wants me to step up in. Um, and I feel like this will empower us as believers to be more efficient within this remit. Um, so one of the ways by which we actually overcome or overcome certain misconceptions, especially when it's to do with evangelism um, and be able to succeed in it is by breaking down specific designs God has actually placed in and around us, which will help to demystify everything and make it less complicated. Um, I think one of the key reasons why um, sometimes people avoid certain things is because they just don't understand it. Um, it's not that they don't want to be a part of it. It's not that many of you don't want to evangelize, but it's like, okay, how... What is this thing and how does it how does it fit into my life? How does this fit into the grand scheme of things? And so today we're going to look to explore this concept through the lens of Luke 5, um, verse 12 to 11. Um, so what I'm going to need you to do, what I'm going to request from you is to really follow me carefully um, as we go through and we deal with different concepts um, in isolation, then we're going to bring them all together. Um, to a central theme um, hopefully that will really impact us and benefit us all um, so yes please engage with me in the comments um, I'm reading your comments but they're lagging a bit so I'm just trying to make sure I don't get thrown off but I am paying attention to what you guys are saying also um, so yeah let's pray and then we're going to go into the word for today 
So, Father, Lord, thank you for your word. We ask that the entrance of your word brings light. Holy Spirit, I ask that you use me as a vessel to speak your truth to your people. I ask that whatever comes out of my mouth would be um, filled with life, filled with wisdom, filled with direction. In the name of Jesus. Amen. So, let's open up our scriptures to the book of Luke. Luke 5, 2 to 11. So, if someone could type that for me in the comments... Luke 5, 2 to 11. Luke 5. Luke is after Matthew if you need some help with that. And then I'm literally just going to go into it. Um, time is of the essence today. So I'm going to be as quick as possible, but I need you to follow me. And obviously the replay will be there to really go back on everything. So I'm going to start reading. And he saw two boats by the lake. But the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked them to put up or put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep and let, your nets, let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing. But at your word, I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in order or in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Wow. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of the fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid, from now you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. Wow, that text is amazing. And I feel like even reading it now, there's a few things that I'm picking up that I didn't necessarily spot before. Um, and it's like this text or what we're going to go through today is by no means exhaustive. There's so much to unpack from this, even with regards to the whole whole concept of evangelism. There's too much to really exhaust um, today alone. But we will be breaking down certain things that I believe will be helpful for the specific purposes of what Holy Spirit wants us to go through today. So we're just going to break down the, the text into bite-sized chunks and I'm, we're just going to walk through it um, within, that, within that way. So what, verse 1 to 3, we see Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret um, where the people were crowning around him and it says, listening to the word of God. He saw um, water or he saw at the water's edge two boats left by there were fishermen who were, who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, one belonging to Simon's and the other one, he asked them to put out or put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. The first point I want to draw out from this is that the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. Now, what does that, what do we pull out from that? We're pulling out the fact that there was a demand for the person of Jesus and for the gospel. There was a demand for the person of Jesus and the gospel. In other words, we see that people were drawn to Jesus as a brand. And as a result, they patronized his product. So what I want us to see this as is being able to distinguish the person from the message. That's one of the key things we need to do when we're looking at the concept of evangelism is breaking down the person of Jesus from the message of Jesus. These are two separate things that when they work in tandem are very powerful, powerful but in isolation, they don't quite complete the, the, the full experience of evangelism. So we're seeing that Jesus himself for the sake of this um, explanation is like a brand. Jesus is the brand. The gospel is the message or the product, the service that Jesus is providing. And this is a key point. Many people are not interested in the product we have to offer because our brand is not attractive. 
People do not like or admire what we represent and therefore unwilling to react or receive what we have to offer. So for example, what I'm basically saying is this. We, many of us that have attempted to evangelize, um, we have a message, we're clued up on the message or we place emphasis on the message, but we fail to represent the person of Jesus effectively in our lives. People weren't drawn to um, the, the message of Jesus alone, but you can see it says that the people crowded round Jesus and then they listened to the words that he uttered. They didn't know what he was going to say. They didn't know what he was going to deliver, but they had heard so much about him. His reputation preceded him that anything that he was going to say, they wanted to listen to. So one of the first points of call we need to understand when it comes to evangelism is that we cannot separate the person of Jesus from the message of Jesus. And now Jesus is not someone that people can see physically now, but he has deposited himself through the Holy Spirit within us. And so we are a reflection like in Genesis, God said we were created in his own image and his likeness. We are, ref uh, we are a re um, earthly reflection of Jesus, of the Godhead themselves. And so we are to emulate by ourselves the brand of Jesus Christ. When people see you, they should see the, the brand of Jesus. It's like when Jesus said, um, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Do people have that same testimony about us? That's one of the first key questions we need to ask. Do people have that same testimony about us? And now we can see going on from that, there is currently a demand for the gospel. And that is despite the sentiment that faith is outdated. We know that like, many people are saying, you know what, Christianity is outdated. Or who still believes that? Oh, really? Is it, is it still normal to, to behave like this or that? Come on, this is the 21st century or the 23rd, whichever one we're in, to be honest. Um, but it's really saying that the gospel is outdated. The gospel is not outdated. Why I say that is because there's a growing hunger we can see for spirituality. And this is where we fit in. This is where the gospel fits in. We see that now more than ever, people are practicing different forms of um, practices or beliefs or faiths that involve or highly based on spirituality. And we can see that there is a deficit in the human heart, in the human um, psyche um, for some type of spiritual engagement beyond this natural realm. And this is where the gospel fits in. So people say that the gospel is outdated, that it's no longer relevant. But I, 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 I sort of battle or resist that statement with the fact that people are, there's a high hunger for spirituality at this moment in time. The next section that we want to focus on. He saw at the edge of the waters two boats. He saw at the water's edge two boats. What does that signify? What does that represent? He's constantly looking or Jesus is constantly looking for available vehicles or vessels that he can use to share his message. So for the gospel to be shared, for Jesus to be able to share that message in that moment in time, he needed a vehicle, he needed a means, he needed a platform by which he could present that message. And now there is currently a demand. There is currently a demand on the earth that Jesus is currently looking for available vessels. He's in need of available vehicles. And now we're sort of just going to go into what I've classified for the purposes of this this teaching um, a vehicle. So I've said, what is a vehicle? Now, a vehicle can come in the form of a sphere. It can come in the form of maybe something like a career. It can come in the form of like a, a business. So we want to see a vehicle as people see it as like a car or whatever, but a vehicle is basically something that houses something or something that transports something. A vehicle is a platform. The boat that Jesus was on provided a platform for him to be able to speak. The emphasis was not on the boat itself, but the boat became significant because the person that needed the boat used it to share a message. And so the platform enables you to showcase your ability. So for example, what can we see as a modern day platform? A podcast. A podcast is a means or a vehicle by which you're able to share a message to share your intellectual property. Same, the same concept of a podcast, so many different giftings can apply to that. And we're gonna to touch on giftings in a second. But it could be a thing where Timmy wants to create a podcast about cars. 
For me, it might be cryptocurrencies. For Pastor Toby, it might be um, business analysis. For maybe, who, who, who can I choose in the comments? For Sam, it's football or sports. Do you get what I mean? So we see that vehicles provide a platform for you to be able to deliver something. Now we see that a vehicle is a mode of transport or provides a vector. It provides a vector. So a vector is something that allows something to be passed through. It's a means by which something can be used to pass something through. So for example, social media is a perfect example of a platform or vehicle. It's a means by which you can pass information, a means by which you can pass something through, pass content through. And sometimes the vehicle is a platform, like I've mentioned, or sometimes it leads to the platform. So sometimes the vehicle is not the platform itself, but it can take you to the platform. And now a vehicle can also be a mode of housing. It can be a mode of um, habitation where a gift is housed. So for example, a book. A book houses the ability of someone who, who writes. The book is the stomping ground of the person who has intellectual property. So for example, all my knowledge on a specific topic matter, if I don't have a platform or if I don't have a vehicle by which to transmit that information, all the information I have is trapped. All the information I have is futile. And this is where we need to begin to break down the different facets at play here and see their significance in the grand scheme of things. So the next section, it says the fishermen were washing their nets. Now, I would ask you, what is a net? What's the significance of the net? And now the Holy Spirit was breaking down or explaining the net to me as a gift. The net you have is a gift. A net can be likened to a gift. It's like a skill or ability that you have. It may even be an idea. The net that you have is a means of impact. It's the means by which you generate results. So, for example, the fishermen can't fish without a net. That's their skill. They've been trained to use, use the nets to be able to catch fish. That's the skill set they have. So it's the mode of capture, and net is a mode of capture. What are we trying to capture? So with nets or with a skill that you have, like your ability, your ability to do something, how well you can do something, has the ability to capture. Capture what? Capture, capture attention, capture influence. So for example, if I'm good at maybe analyzing, and that's what I do for a living, people know me for my ability to analyze. That, has what, that is what... I use to create an impact, but it's also what draws attention to me as a person. My ability, my skill, the skill that God has given me enables people to be, um, to, 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 to create awareness that I am good at this thing, if that makes sense. It's also a mode of leverage. So your skill enables you to, 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 to attain a certain amount of leverage. And what do I mean? So look at it like this. If we're looking at it from the perspective of the fishermen who were fishing in the boat, the mode of leverage or their skill set is, think of it like this. So they're up on the boat, right? The fish are down here. They're dropping their nets. Your, your skill gives you an advantage over what you're capturing, if that makes sense. Your skill places you in a places of, place of higher ability, higher authority in relation to whatever it is or whoever it is that seeks what you need. So for example, if I'm very informed on management or uh, let's say scriptures, it provides a leverage where people have to come to you to find out certain things, if that makes sense. So for example, if I have a deficit, I'm trying to make a website, I don't know how to make one, but there's a guy or a, a lady that knows how to make websites, I have to go to them. So that means there's leverage involved where I am coming to you because I'm seeking out something. So what am I saying? Your net gives you an advantage. Your net gives you or creates a, a, an amount of leverage. And so going on to the next point as well, um, your net is also uh, uh, something that creates a mode of opportunity and access. An uh, it creates a mode of opportunity and access. What does this do? It makes you more visible. It brings more attention to you. It distinguishes you. It opens up doors and opportunities for you 
Why do I say this? Proverbs 18 verse 16 says, the gift that a man has will create room for him. The gift that you have opens doors, opens opportunities. It makes you visible to the people that need you or you need, if that makes sense. So for example, we see that the skill that David had playing the harp brought him before King Saul. There was a demand that was placed on his gift. Saul needed what he had to be able to be well mentally or stably. And so David was called into the palace because his skill had gained so much visibility, it opened up a door for him in an arena that he wouldn't be otherwise be able to um, access. Another example, Joseph's ability to interpret dreams opened the door for him in the palace of Pharaoh. So you can see that it created um, attention, it created visibility. There was uh, someone who worked in the king's palace that remembered him because of his gift. Sometimes people won't remember you. This is, this is something to, uh, to enlighten us. And sometimes we take it personal as to, oh, why don't people like me? Or why don't people take to me as a person ETC? Sometimes people are just drawn to you because of your gift. And there's nothing wrong with that. Sometimes it's your ability. It's like, they love me. There's a phrase where you probably have heard, they like me for the money or they like me because I'm this. They don't like me as a person. And that's, that's the truth. That's the harsh reality sometimes. Sometimes people are drawn to you because of your gift, because of your skill set. And that's how God has made it to be, that your skill attracts attention. Your net will attract attention. The net, the boat of Simon Peter caught the attention of Jesus. And so this is where we need to begin to see where these things come into play. And I'm going to tie it all in. And so this is just a word of encouragement, um, this, this, this small breakdown here, um, because as I was going through this, the Lord began to share with me um, how, how he decides to deal with some of our gifts. Um, and I've called it the life cycle of the gift or three key points in the life cycle of the gift. One of the first stages that we go through is preservation. And you can sort of airmark this as the preserving of a gift before it's exposed. And many of us are in that preservation stage where God has been training you on a specific thing. He's been teaching you for so many years. You've been crafting or you've been sculpting or harnessing a specific skill set or specific gifting or ability that God has placed in your hand. And he's preserving it. Preser preserving it before exposure, which means that it's not as it's not visible, it's not as visible to the world as it should be yet. And for those of you in your preservation stage, don't get discouraged. Be faithful in the stage of preservation. Preservation sort of implies that you're being protected, you're being shielded for a moment of time before you are ready to be exposed. It's like an egg. A bird or a hen lays on the, the, the eggs of her children. Why? Because they're not mature enough to be able to handle the exposure of their natural environment. So they have to be covered. They have to be shielded. And the Lord is saying to you, or many of you, that he's shielding you in this time. Many of you have been getting frustrated as to, Lord, it's my time. Why is X and Y out there? Um, and, and it seems like I'm not gaining traction. I'm not gaining visibility. The Lord is saying that is, that is how he's positioned you in this season to protect you from harm's way, to protect you from being exposed to an env environment you're not yet equipped for. That's the preservation stage. Then you have deployment. The deployment stage, <laughs> someone said, please send the diagram. <laughs> the deployment stage is the dispatching of a gift or the exposing of a gift. So after the stage of preservation, we can see that the Lord will deploy you or send you or make your gift more visible. So for example, many people may not have known Simon Peter before. Maybe they've known him as, as a fisherman, but he hadn't crossed over to that level where his business had been visible or who he was was more, was more visible. But I tell you what, after Jesus placed a demand on his boat and people saw him catching nets that caused his boat to sink, I tell you his business would have boomed after that. His name would have started ringing bells. And this is what happens when the Lord decides to expose a gift after preservation. He can see that he's crafted you enough to be able to handle the weight of what he's called you to. Then he's ready to deploy you. 
So you see that soldiers, they're deployed after their training. They go through the period of time where they're training, they go through rigorous drills, exercises, mental, uh, mental fortitude is built, and then they're deployed off to Iraq, Afghanistan, Lagos, Lekki Tollbridge. God, <laughs> to those on Lekki Tollbridge, help Nigeria, please, in Jesus' name. Amen. Ensars, hashtag. A good example of this is John the Baptist. In Luke 180, we see that John was hidden in the wilderness. It says that, so the child grew strong or the child grew and became strong in spirit and was in the desert till the day of his manifestation to Israel. So you can see that John the Baptist, through majority of his life, was hidden in the wilderness. Jesus calls this man the greatest prophet of the of the time or, or, or to, to be recorded. This man was hidden in the wilderness. God preserved him for a time in the wilderness until it says until the day of his manifestation, until the day of his showing. I want to tell you that there's a day of your showing where after the Lord has finished dealing with you, after the Lord has finished preparing you and harnessing what he's placed inside of you, there is a day of your manifestation. There's a day where you won't have to announce yourself. You won't have to look for the affirmation of people. There's a, there's a day where the Lord will expose your gifting, expose your person to the eyes of the people that need you. Amen. And the third stage is called hibernation. Hibernation is literally what it says on the tip. And you can see that there's a, there's, a, there's a similarity between preservation and hibernation, which is the fact that this involves hiding. But they're two separate pro processes. Hibernation is the process by which you attain rest. You go into a time of rest. You go into a time of recuperation. There is a time of preservation when you're hidden before you're deployed. Then there's a time where you're deployed, but there's a time where maybe the Lord needs you to rest or recuperate. There's a time where he needs you to shed some skin. Okay, phase one is complete. Now you need to move on to phase two. But before the caterpillar turns into a butterfly, it goes into hibernation. It goes into its cocoon where it begins to develop and go through the, um, the process of what we call metamorphosis. Hibernation is the time of metamorphosis. Hibernation is the time of reflection. Hibernation is the time where you reflect on what God has used you to do. But it's like, okay, for me to go onto or transition onto this next phase of what he's called me to do, for me to actually be effective on what he's called me to do, I need to reevaluate myself. Not just to reevaluate my gifting, but the Lord uses hibernation to deal with the posture of your heart. He uses hibernation as a time where men have given you accolades because they've seen you've been able to do so much. But then the Lord says, go into hiding. I need you to check your heart. All this clout has got to your head. All this clout has made you blindsided to the fact that you're actually weak in these areas. All this pressure, all this demand on your gift has, ha has made you feel like you need to please people. I need you to rest before you crash and burn out. And the Lord is saying that for some of you, you've gone through a period of hibernation where people know what you're about. People know what you're, what, 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 um, what, what, what you're, what you're good at doing or how God has used you before. But it seems like things are quiet now. It seems like the, the book is not coming in. It seems like, oh, the opportunity is dried up. It seems like you got sacked or the, the, the jobs are not coming in the way you thought they would. And God is saying, this is your time of hibernation. I need you to reconfigure. I need you to reassess, reanalyze where I'm calling you to next and reposition yourself. And we can see this, a key example of this is 1 Kings 19, 3 to 6, where Elijah flees to the wilderness after killing the prophets of Baal. And then he was taken to the wilderness where he was fed by angels. He was given heavenly food, manna as such. So we can see Elijah carrying out one of the most reputable, reputable acts in scripture where he's literally just called down fire from heaven and killed the prophets of Baal. But the same mighty man of God fled for his life to the wilderness because he needed to hide. Even though he was able to carry this out, God exposed the fear inside of him. And sometimes after our greatest exploits, after our greatest achievements, we are the most vulnerable. 
And the Lord says that to many of us that after your, your achievements, after you've been able to accomplish such, always make it a practice to hide yourself in the secret place. Psalm 91 is key. He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Another scripture says that he will hide you under his feathers, under his wings. Sometimes after moments of exploits and great achievements, we need to hide in the presence of God. Back to the scripture in Luke. It says, and he sat down and he taught the people from the boat. Like I said, he placed a demand on the vessel. He used it as a vehicle by which he could teach the gospel and expand the kingdom. And we see that whenever Christ wants to partner with us, he will use our vehicle or our nets for the purposes of the kingdom. Many of you, many of us, because I'm involved in this message as much as anyone else, we need to realise that the vehicles, the gifting or the nets, the vehicle or the nets that we've been given, the platform or the ability we've been given, is only a means by which the gospel is to be expanded. And this is why I feel like God made it by design that people sometimes only focus on a gifting versus the person itself. This is to help you realize that your skill can be so prominent, but your person can be so undeveloped. You can be anointed yet dysfunctional. The key distinction between the person and the gift and all the person and the message. And God has made it like this so that we in, we overall don't necessarily decide to take the glory for ourselves because the message we're being used to preach is not about us. Me preaching the gospel is not about me. The message that I'm preaching attracts you to the person of Jesus Christ. And so I'm left out of the picture. What does that mean? It means that anytime that I feel prideful, anytime that I feel like my words carry so much weight, People remind me that without me, the gospel will still be preached. There's no emphasis on me. I didn't die to save you. I can't do anything for you. But it's the message that draws you to the person. And so when all is said and done and Israel is, is no longer trending or Israel is no longer popular or Israel is not as, as skilled as he was before, the message still continues. This is one of the ways by which God has made it that the gospel does not die with one person. Even Jesus himself, he could have been selfish and said, oh, the gospel has been preached by everyone. But what did he do? He said that another would come. John 16 verse 13 tells us, how be it when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide us into all truth. He will not testify of himself, but testify of the father. Jesus himself made it so that even though he died or even when he died, even when he was no longer able physically there to perform miracles, he left us with his Holy Spirit. Why? Because he understood the message of the gospel far succeeds any one given person. He made it so that he couldn't, the gospel couldn't even be tied down by him alone. His presence or his non-existence. This is why he commissioned the disciples. This is why he made them apostles and sent them into, into the world to make disciples. He imparted the message of the gospel into people. So remember that the vessel or the vehicle, the gifting that you've been given is to expand the kingdom. Always check the motive of your heart. Now we're looking at verse 4 to 5. It says that he put out into deep water. He said, let me read verse 4. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. Because you say so, I will let down the nets. And now, it says that he put out, put out his nets into the deep. The deep represents a God realm of provision. The deep represents the provision of God. It, it, it depicts a, a storehouse where God makes certain things available to a specific group of people. Notice how for the deep to be accessed or for the deep to be open, Simon Peter was only able to access it at the word of Jesus. He said, at your word, I will let down my nets. At your word, the deep is open. At the word of God, resources that aren't available to you under normal circumstances are made available because there's a different source. There's a different um, storehouse by which you're able to access 
back to at the word of God. At your word, I will let down the nets. So when you partner with God, he exposes you to a different reserve. The shallow waters are crowded. I want you to know that. Many of you have been setting down your nets in shallow waters. Waters where everyone accesses from. The shallow places are easy for everyone to congregate. And it reminds me of a saying that crabs in a barrel. Where everyone is fighting for the same thing. Everyone is fighting for the same resources. <coughs> everyone is fighting to be distinguished. But let me tell you something. When God opens up the deep to you. It's, limit, it's for a limited set of people. There are unlimited, unlimited reserves. The deep is available to a limited set of people but has unlimited reserves. There is no cap to the resources you're able to experience or lay hold of when God opens the deep onto you. And so we see that only a few people have a capacity for the deep. To access the deep, you need the permission of God. You need the permission of or the word of the Holy Spirit to be able to open up the deep. That's deep. That is deep. No pun intended. <laughs> and Father, right now I speak in the name of Jesus that you would even open up the access of the deep unto your children right now in the name of Jesus. And Father, we ask that your word would unlock the deep. Your word would unlock the realm of unlimited resources for your children in the name of Jesus. Amen. The next, it says, let down the nets for a catch. Now, if we notice the word net or the word nets there is plural. And so we see that if we now want to bring it into the context or concept that we're explaining, what is a net? A gifting or an ability. So if there's plural, that means that the nets represented multiple or can represent multiple giftings or multiple abilities. That's one thing, or this is one thing the Lord wanted me to highlight, is that many of you, he's given you multiple gifts or what you're called multi-talented, multi-faceted. And that is for a reason. You've not just been given one net, but multiple nets. And the Lord is saying that in this time, in this period, it is time for us to use as many nets as we have been given. It's not enough to use one. It's not enough to use two if you've been given five. The Lord needs to, over your lifetime, see the utilization of all five nets that he's given you. All five gifts that he's given you must be used to maximum capacity. Where do we get this from? We see the parable of the talents in Matthew 20, 14 to, 14 to 30. We see that different um, uh, the different the different people were given a different measure of wealth to be able to trade with or talents as we as they would call, be called which are amounts of gold or metrons of gold and we can see that different graces were placed on them uh, um, pro probably by their ability or or, or or whatever the master saw that he, he used to measure how how much he gave them but to one he gave one another two another five another ten another fifty. Use as many talents, use as many giftings, use as many nets as you've been given to be able to attract people or to spread the message of the gospel. That's what I'm getting at. That's what I'm tying this into. The next, the next part of that scripture says, we have worked hard, but at your word. We have worked, we have toiled all night, but at your word. And the Holy Spirit was highlighting the significance of working in the flesh Versus working by obedience and how that yields two different results. You can see the, 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 the pre-side of that scripture said, Lord, we have toiled all night. We've done everything we can do in our own ability. These guys were skilled fishers, by the way. They've been fishing for years. And we know that these skills are usually passed down from one, from one generation to the next. So their dad would have probably been fishermen and, and taught them the trade. So we can see these were men that were skilled at their occupation. Many of you are skilled at your place of work. You're skilled in your place of, 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 of business or you're skilled in a certain skill set. And it's like, Lord, I've done everything in my capacity. Why is this thing not popping the way it should? Why is my brand or why is my disc not banging? Why is it not? Why is it not doing as well as it should? But then the next part of that scripture says, at your word. At your word. 
So we can see that at the word of Jesus, operating in the spirit, being connected to the, the mind of God, the instruction of God, yielded two different results, or it's about to yield two different results. Many of you, God is saying, you've been doing what you've been doing in the flesh, and that's why it yields you nothing. There's a scripture that's even coming to mind now that says that the flesh prof profited nothing. Imagine, even used that set of words, the flesh profits for nothing. But in the spirit, there's life. And so the Lord is saying that many of you need to function or operate from a place of at the word of God, which means that you need to be up to date. Not what God said two years ago, five years ago, if it's not relevant to the, if he has another instruction for you, he's saying you need to be up to date. Simon Peter said, at your word, which means that at this moment in time, because you said this now, I'm going to obey now. That's another thing. God is saying that don't obey when you feel like it. And this word is for me as well. At your word, I will do it. That means at, at that precise moment in time, provision had been made available if he had acted now. Many of you, you've acted, but in delayed, delayed action. Delayed, obe de delayed obedience is, is null and void. Why? Because at that moment, the deep was about to open. There was a moment in time where the word of God had to cross or interlink with the deep. The deep was literally responding to the word of God at that time. And if that intersect was missed, that means he wouldn't have been able to, to capture the resources that were meant for him. So we can see that there's a level of obedience that we need to be able to exude, especially when perpetuating the message of the gospel. Many of us have tried to do it in our own strength. We've tried to do it in our own um, manner, within our own intellect. We've studied the scriptures and instead of, instead of allowing the Holy Spirit to give us wisdom, we try to argue with people about scriptures and tell them X, Y, Z or my family member, I want them to be saved so bad and you're trying to shove Jesus down their throats but the Lord is saying, at my word, You'd be surprised what is able to manifest at my word. Sila. Now, on to the next, on to the next set of verses, which is from verse six onwards. It says that they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. And now for me, what that represented or what I saw from this was that Simon became so accustomed to natural supply, to the shallow waters, that when he encountered the deep, he realized his capacity was not enough to facilitate it. And so going on from that, this is why we're not to despise the processing of God or the season of process. Sometimes we're in a haste for our gifts to be exposed, not realizing that God is training us to handle the deep. The reason why your, your music or the reason why your, your brand or the reason why you haven't got that promotion is because the Lord is saying you're not yet in a position to handle it. The Lord is saying you're not mature enough to handle what comes with it. Yes, you're competent enough to carry out the task, but it's not just the task that opens up when the promotion comes or when that next thing comes. It's everything that comes. We, we, we say this phrase, it comes with the territory. You want the clout, you want the fame, you want the visibility, but you, are you ready for the backlash? Are you ready for people to watch your words like a hawk on Twitter? And when you say the wrong, the wrong thing, they, then you get corn and your face is a meme. Is your mental capacity built to that stage yet where you can handle the, 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 the fame that comes with, with, with your gifting or with the exposure you're looking for? The Lord is saying that, yes, you're a trained fisherman, but are your boats ready to receive the weight of the fish that I'm about to give you? That's a word for some of you. Put two and two together. The next part says, they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. Now, Simon had, a call, had to call for reinforcements. And the scripture says both boats began to sink. And that means when we're not adequately prepared, what was meant to bless us will cause us to sink. This is literally what I was saying in the previous point. What was supposed to bless you? What's supposed to bring blessing to Simon Peter, the fish? Because his boats, because his nets weren't able to fully handle the weight of it, the boats began to sink. And this is what we realize. Many of us realize that when we get to or when we receive 
what we've been asking from God, we begin to sink under the pressure of it. So God is saying, look, do not despise the preservation and the hibernation phases of your gift cycle. Because it's not just the gift that's in demand. Your person is what presents the gift. And the weight that is being placed on the gift will be placed on your person. This is why you can be anointed or we can be anointed. But the same anointing that rests upon you, the same demand, the, the, the same demand that's placed on your anointing will also be placed on your character. When more demand, when more pressure is placed on your character or your person, the cracks begin to show. It begins to show when you're not resilient. It begins to show when you're not patient. It begins to show when you're not loving or when you're not thoughtful or when you're too selfish. The next part says, so they pulled their boats back up to shore and left everything and followed him. And now, the crux of that was that, for me, it highlighted the fact that our true journey as a believer doesn't begin until we are ready to leave behind everything of worth for us. Everything that is of worth to us in order to follow Jesus. This man had been a fisher for so long, but one encounter led him to come to the conclusion, everything that I've built up over this period of time is worth giving away. And I feel like many of us, we struggle to yield to God, to fully live out this call because we haven't reached that stage where we feel like God is more than everything that I have or anything that I could have. God is not more important to you than your job yet. Your career aspirations, your ambitions are still too high in the, in the realm of your appetite. Your appetite for God does not outweigh the appetite for your ambition. And this is what makes many of us so ineffective when it comes to evangelism. Because when we're selling the story of the gospel, it's so half-hearted. Even you don't believe the gospel that you're sharing. So maybe I, sometimes maybe I don't even, I'm not even convicted in the message that I'm preaching. And it shows because at your place of work or wherever it is, they're asking you, oh, I'm a Muslim. What faith are you, by the way? Oh, yeah. Then we had the groanings that cannot be uttered that I spoke of in scripture. When it's time to share the gospel, as quiet as a mouse, but when it's time to talk about scandal, we can talk. When it's time to talk about clubhouse, we can talk. But when it's time to talk about the gospel, um, 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 begin to hum as if we've never hummed before. Those days have to end. <laughs> Those days have to end where we need to be convicted. If not, the scripture says, I'd rather you be hot or cold. Look, for the person that doesn't believe in God, they do it with their chest. God knows where they stand. God can say, I can deal with them in this way because they've shown that, okay, I don't believe in you. Now God can see, okay, this is how I have to work with this person. The person that is sold out for Christ, radical. Everyone knows. They're convicted in themselves. God knows that this is someone that can trust him. But the person in the middle, what does God do with that person? That's why God said, I'd rather you be hot or cold. Let me know where you stand. Let people know where you stand. Not that, ah, oh, you know what, I'm, I'm Christian, but you know what? I have a star sign or whatever you're mixing Christianity with with energies and new age or whatever you're mixing we're doing mixing whatever we need to end if <laughs> we need to end that line of behavior activity if we want to be the Christians that have been spoken about or that God will be pleased with there needs to be a level of conviction we need to be willing to leave behind everything anything at any given moment for the sake of the gospel. That is the gospel that should be preached. That is the standard mark of the gospel. If you're not ready to leave behind, ask yourself today, I need to ask myself, if I'm not ready to leave behind everything that I had, I'm not talking about those of us that are suffering because we're ready to leave that one behind. But for those of us that have it good, when you reach the climax of what, what you're looking at, are you ready? Are we ready at that time to give up everything that we have for the sake of the gospel? If not, we should just cancel our, 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 our Christianity. It seems very harsh or, or harsh or very brash, but that's the true fact of it. We've been sold a gospel where it's like, oh yeah, you can work your way into it. You can work your way up, up, up in, in terms of commitment. But the honest truth is that if we're going to be successful in this day and age, 
we need to be nothing short of convicted. We need to be nothing short of radical about what we believe. Amen. And now... Hmm. Where should I go? Holy Spirit. Because I'm going to wrap up in the next few minutes. Uh, I'm going to wrap up in the next few minutes. So I need to decide what I'm going to do. Cool. So I'm going to touch on something quickly. Um, and it's basically understanding how your gift functions within an environment and a climate and what i've written here it says when the climate or environment places a demand on your gift leverage is created why this is so important and i'm going to tie everything in as to am i talking about gifts am i talking about vehicles am i talking about evangelism what am i talking about it's all going to come to come together um shortly but basically, when the climate or environment places a demand on your gift, leverage is created. So basically, this is to, if we tie this back into the life cycle of the gift, God wants us to come into the limelight when there's a demand placed on our gift. So for example, if we use the example of John, John the Baptist, right? John came out of the wilderness when the demand for a savior, the demand for a Christ, and the demand for the message of repentance and the kingdom was needed at that moment in time. Any time, if John had been released any time outside of that time, what he was doing would have been of null effect. He wouldn't be effective in what he's been called to do. Many of you, your assignment, it's not yet time. The climate is not yet to favour you. For example, we see in the book of Genesis, chapters 6 to 8, Noah was instructed to build an ark to be able to save the people and the creatures that God needed to save and to be able to start another life after the flood would come. The ark seemed null and void when the ground was dry. People would have looked at Noah and laughed at him thinking, what are you building? A boat. They've probably never seen a boat before, mind you. They've probably never seen a flood. So they're thinking, what's the purpose of this thing? However, the relevance and the importance of the ark came into play when the flood came. And many of you, God is saying that the flood hasn't come. What you've been building isn't for now, it's for the future. What you're building is not for now. It's not so you can jump on trends or hypes now. It's for what is to come. There's a trend that is yet to come that I'm preparing you for. So you will be ahead of time. We always talk about the sons of Issachar. They knew the times and understand, understood the seasons and they knew what to do. Many people, they talk about that, but they don't like being ahead of their time. Why? Because until... You're, if When you're ahead of your time, you're most of the time in the now, you're, you're irrelevant. People don't get what you're doing. People don't get what you're building. People are always questioning you and it causes you to question yourself, making you feel like, I don't have relevance now. No one's looking at my thing. It's not relevant. And so many of us want to be ahead of our time, but we're not ready to bear the brunt of what comes with being ahead of your time. And the Lord is saying that the climate is yet to favour you. But God is saying that we're stepping into a time, especially now, bringing us back into Isaiah 60, where it says, gross darkness will cover the earth, but there will come a light. God is saying that the climate, the climate, the environment, gross darkness is your signal that your time is arriving. Gross darkness is your signal to tell you that the gospel is needed more now more than ever. The gospel is needed, but it needs a platform, which is your vehicle, which is your gifting. So, many times we are prepared, but the climate is yet to favour what has been placed in our hands. Your gift is not significant until the climate is favourable for its manifestation. <coughs> and so now, in summary, because I'm going to start wrapping up now. It's like, it's like this. See the bolt and see the net as the platform by which Jesus used to relay the message of the gospel but then we see at the end Jesus says to Peter come follow me and I will make you fishers of men I want you to now put your net or your vehicle where it says fishers he's going to make you fishers of men but utilizing your vehicle using your skill set and this is now where 
the relevance of evangelism comes in. Because many of you have been asking, ah, you know what, uh, I don't know how to do it, how X does it. But God has placed a specific skill set in your hands. He's given you a specific toolbox by which he needs to relay information to a specific group of people. So God has equipped you with a platform, with a vehicle, but also a skill set, your gift in your net to be able to reach out to a specific demographic. So this is where I'm going with this message now. And now it's understanding that, okay, yes, you may have done it before, but many of you haven't realized that you're the reason, one of the final reasons as to why you're yet to be catapulted into the fullness of your expression is because you don't understand the message you're yet to carry. Many of you think you're, you're looking for that promotion so you can buy a, a, a range or save for a house. But the Lord is saying, no, I've placed you in that place because there's a message. There's a certain level of excellence I need you to exude that people will be attracted to and that will display a certain level of light. I've placed you in the arena of policy because there's some policies I want to change, not because I want you to rub shoulders with Boris and take pictures. Many of us, the final piece to the puzzle, puzzle is understanding the message. So God is calling many of us to understand the message now. You've understood your vehicle. You've understood your net but you haven't understood the message. And this is where now we tie everything in. So these are some questions I want to leave us with as I'm wrapping up. I want you to, over the next week, over the next few weeks, or however long it takes you, what are the vehicles I have been given? That's the first question. What are the nets I've been given? That's the second question. What stage of the life cycle is my gift in? That's the third question. Number four, am I in the right environment to flourish or for my gift to flourish? And number five, is the climate favorable for my gift to flourish? The final question, number six, do I understand the message which I am called to preach and the people who I'm called to preach it to? So, tying everything together, I hope this all makes sense because I touched on everything from in isolation, but I wanted to draw it together. And I hope you see the importance of this. Like I said, evangelism is such a huge topic. One cannot even begin to exhaust it. But for us at City Worship, there is such a strong mandate, such a strong um, desire of the Lord to reach people that are beyond our current circles, people that haven't heard the gospel, people that need the light of Christ. So we need to begin to think on these things, but I'm just going to run the questions one more time for those of you that didn't get it. Number one, what vehicles have I been given? What vehicles have I been given? Number two, what nets have I been given? What nets have I been given? Number three, what stage of the life cycle is my gift in? So that's preservation, deployment, hibernation. Number four, am I in the right environment for my gift to flourish? Am I in the right environment for my gift to flourish? Number five, is the climate favorable for my gift to flourish? So, for example, the difference between an environment and a climate is like, okay, cool. There's soil, there's grass, you plant your seeds in the ground. Yes, the environment is there ready to take your gift, but the climate, the temperature, the moisture, the nutrients that is needed for your gift to grow, is it there? Has that season come? This is why there's seed time, there's harvest. During the winter, our crops don't grow because it's not favourable. That's the climate. The environment is the ground by which your gift or your seed is placed. And number six, do I understand the message I've been called to preach and the people I've been called to preach it to? So I feel like once we start to consider all these points, you'll begin to demystify the concept of evangelism. You may not be able to preach on the street corner, which all of us need to, to be honest, because I feel like one of the huge reasons is because of fear, confidence, lack of confidence and, and shame. Shame of looking a fool, 
like fear of maybe not being outspoken. So I feel like that context in itself, a lot of us need to be liberated by actually doing that. We shouldn't hide behind, oh yeah, I preach the gospel at work. No, the gospel is to be preached everywhere. If the Lord sends you, it's like when Noah, when Noah was sent to Nineveh, if the Lord sends you to somewhere, you cannot refuse. And so it's not just enough to say, oh Lord, this is where I'm comfortable saying it. No, where you send me, I will follow. Peter said, I will drop everything and follow you. He didn't know where, the, where God was going to send him to. But we have been given specific skill sets or specific environment, specific remits by which we will be more effective. So based on that, I want us to begin to now brainstorm and now challenge ourselves. Okay, yes, I'm not maybe the best in that, in that, in that context, but in this context by which I've been given, I need to challenge myself. Who are the next few people that I can start speaking to? Who are the next few people the Lord will use me to, to even uh, impart this message of salvation? So we're just going to pray and we're going to wrap up there. So Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the, 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 the wisdom that's been imparted to us through your Holy Spirit. Thank you for demystifying the concept of evangelism. Holy Spirit, help us to even go through this, this, this word and to be able to see which parts are applicable and how we can start to make it practical, how we can start to apply it. Father, give us the boldness because ultimately we need your boldness. Um, it's not easy um, to preach the gospel, especially if we're timid, but your word says the righteous would be as bold as lions. Father, equip us with boldness to be able to speak your word, preach your word in and out of season, when it's cool, when it's not, when it's trending, when it's not, even when it will cause us to be hated or persecuted. And Father, I'm asking, oh God, that as your children go into this week, you would bless them, you would favour them, you would protect them. In the name of Jesus, you would open up doors for them in whatever um, respective path they need it opened in, in the name of Jesus. I'm asking that doors of opportunity would be opened up and I ask that they will not forget the message and the person by which they need to um, represent and relay in the name of Jesus. Amen. So thank you guys for joining us this Sunday. Thank you for sticking with me. Um, I know that was a lot of information or a lot of um, a lot of different things to grasp, but thank God you guys can go back and uh, make notes where, where necessary. Um, and definitely let us know if that word has imparted you or impacted um, your your life or, or different ways you reason things, please let us know. DM us on Instagram. Um, we love to share testimonies. If you have testimonies, share with us. Um, if you need prayer, reach out to us all the same as well. Um, if you haven't given, feel free to give. Like and subscribe our YouTube channel. All the necessary on socials, IG as well. And yeah, um, we'd love to hear from you. Um, and thank you all for bearing with me today. Um, so yeah, take care and God bless.